everyone, this is Gauza, the self-proclaimed physics detective. Today I'm investigating what has been called the ultimate power in the universe. That's right, the Death Star. More specifically, I'm going to answer the question, how powerful is the Death Star's super laser? So without any further ado, let's get started. The super laser is at least powerful enough to destroy a planet, so the real question that needs answering is, how much energy does it take to destroy a planet? The answer to this question, in turn, depends on two factors. First, what do you mean when you say destroy a planet, and second, well, what kind of planet? These two questions are a little bit interconnected, but we'll get to that later. Let's tackle the first question. The first law of thermodynamics states that matter cannot be created or destroyed. What this means is that any definition of planetary distraction can, at most, include breaking up the planet and scattering the pieces far enough away so that they can't reform on their own. With that in mind, let's take a closer look at the different bonds that hold matter together. To better explain what role each of the different bonds play, let's consider a gigantic ball made of ice cubes floating in space. Starting things off, the separate ice cubes are held together by gravity. If you break the gravimetric bonds holding the ice cubes together, the result will be countless ice cubes drifting alone through space. Next, the individual ice cubes are made of H2O molecules that are held together by a type of intermolecular bond called a hydrogen bond. If you break the intermolecular bonds, then instead of having cubes of ice, you would have individual molecules floating about. Effectively, you will have gone from having ice cubes to having steam. Continuing on down are the molecular bonds. In breaking these, we would go from having steam to having a mixture of hydrogen gas and oxygen. On the atomic scale, there are two different types of bonds that we could talk about. First, electrons are bound to the nucleus by means of the electromagnetic force. Stripping away the electrons would result in free electrons and ionized nuclei. Secondly, with the exception of hydrogen, atoms are made of both protons and neutrons that are held together by what is called the strong nuclear force. Breaking the strong force bonds would mean that all that is left is essentially a massive radiation field. Free electrons being considered beta radiation, and free neutrons being one of the primary radiation dangers of nuclear reactors. So, having discussed the different bonds that we could break and the effects of breaking them, the question becomes which do we include in our definition of blowing up a planet? Including the binding energy of protons and neutrons to each other, or of electrons to nuclei, would be a very bad idea. The scattering ions would have such a powerful electric charge that it could potentially rip the electrons away from the matter that the Death Star is made of, which would likely kill any personnel on board that are affected. While breaking the chemical bonds would be impressive, it's arguably overkill, so that leaves just intermolecular bonds and gravimetric bonds. Gravity bonds are a sure thing because if they go untouched, it would mean that the planet has, at most, been turned into a slurry of chemicals. So then, what about including the intermolecular bonds? This brings us to the second of our two big questions. What kind of planet are we talking about? The reason this is important is that bonds between molecules are strongest in solids and weakest in gases. So if you want to destroy a planet made up of mostly gas, like Bespin, it's likely that the energy needed to break the gases apart would be so small so as to hardly affect the result. But what about a planet that's not mostly gas? For instance, what if the Earth was the target? The answer is that calculating the intermolecular bonds within the Earth would require an intimate knowledge of both the Earth's interior structure and the behavior of many different elements and compounds under the conditions that exist inside the Earth. Now, while we know a lot about the interior of the Earth, arguably we don't know enough to calculate the value for intermolecular bonding with nearly the same accuracy as we can gravimetric bonding. So, to make a long story short, I'm only going to be calculating the energy required to overcome the gravity holding the Earth together. So, after doing some math, we reach a solution of 308 million joules. That's equivalent to 74 zeta tons of TNT, or 134 trillion times the estimated total yield of the current United States nuclear arsenal, or all the energy released by the sun over the course of 9 days, 7 hours, and 50 minutes. 
What does this mean for the Death Star? For starters, the so-called expanded Star Wars universe indicates that the first Death Star could charge up a shot once every 24 hours, which means that the Death Star's main reactor would need a power output ten times greater than that of the Sun. Additionally, the second Death Star was designed so that it could shoot its super laser every three minutes, which means that its power generator would have a power output greater than 4,000 suns. Anyway, before I get carried away on wild tangents, I should probably wrap up this video. Personally, I was blown away, pun intended, by just how high the results turned out to be. What about you, though? Is the result higher or lower than you expected? Let me know in the comments below. As always, if you like this video, hit like and subscribe. Subscribing is not only a great way to show your support and to encourage me to keep doing what I do, but it also helps you stay in the know about the happenings on my channel. Additionally, if you want to know what I'm up to before it hits YouTube, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Well, that's all I have for you today. This is Gauzar, the self-proclaimed physics detective, and may the Force be with you, always.